Good afternoon. Um, my job today is to introduce the guide to you. Um, this is the document itself. If you haven't yet got a copy, um, as Dick said earlier, it is available to purchase from Syria in hard copy, or it is also freely available to download off the Syria website in digital PDF format. If you would like a copy, the website address is at the bottom of the slide there, and I'll just read it out if you wanted to jot it down. It's www.syria.org forward slash service forward slash landfills. The purpose of the guide is to provide the reader with some practical advice on how to deal with the type of issues that we've seen in that introduction there. That can be both immediate or ongoing issues that need an operational response or issues which may arise at some point in the future that need to be considered within the longer term strategic management process. The guide itself is really focused on coastal, estuarine and harbour settings and as such deals with issues of coastal erosion, coastal landslips and sea flooding. The types of sites that are covered within the guidance include permitted landfill sites and that can be classified as either open operational landfills that are accepting and managing waste or closed landfills that are still permitted but are closed to accepting new waste and are undergoing aftercare procedures. The second group of sites really is old landfills. That can be surrendered landfills or historic landfills. And as Jim mentioned, many of the historic landfills actually predate environmental regulation. So they store up old legacies from, from previous times. And the third area is a more general um, category of other areas of land contamination. And they include many other industrial legacy sites. So it could be areas, for example, of colliery spoil or ships ballast. As Dick mentioned in his presentation, we're really working at the overlap between two principal sectors here, coastal management sector and also the waste, pollution prevention control and contaminated land sectors. And we recognize that there's already an awful lot of existing guidance in each of these sectors. And therefore, the new guide is working at this overlap. We're not seeking to reinvent the wheel. So there's already good guidance available on how to design a seawall, for example or how to design a, an investigation to um, assess whether or not a site should be classified as contaminated land. What this guidance is doing is really looking at the, the interesting aspects that overlap between these two areas, and it will signpost at various points to some other relevant guidance documents. The target readership of the guide, as you can see from this list that's coming up on screen now, is actually very wide. Each of these organizations will have different perspectives, different viewpoints, and due to that, we held a scoping phase at the outset of the study. And during that process, we looked um, at developing an industry-wide questionnaire, and we held a workshop to gain views from all of these different sectors. And that information really helped us to structure the guide. And if you have a copy, you will notice that it's actually structured in four parts. The first part is really the core of the guide. And that provides a framework for people who have to deal with the types of issues that we've seen um, in the introduction in an operational sense. So it's identifying sites right the way through to delivering solutions and evaluating performance. The second part of the guide recognizes some of these wider views and standpoints from different organizations or different timescales, for example, that need to be considered. Um, and they are um, represented as a series of chapters we've called perspectives. The third part of the guide covers some more cross-cutting themes that are relevant in whatever context you're looking, such as legislation, funding, stakeholder engagement, and so on. And the final part of the guide presents three different detailed case studies which draw out specific elements um, and illustrate how they've been applied in practice. Now, later on this afternoon, we'll be hearing about each of these different case studies in more detail, so I'll not mention any more about that now. Also, later on, I'll be preparing a presentation 
on parts two and three of the guide, the perspectives and themes. So again, I'll come back to that later. But for now, um, I'm going to focus on part one of the guidance framework. Um, part, sorry, part one of the guide, this core guidance framework. Um, one of the things that we've produced at the very front of the guide is what we've called a route map that helps the reader go through the process and identify who has particular roles and responsibilities for a, for a given site. Now that is presented in detail in section 2.3 of the guide if you have a copy to hand, but is summarized within a flow chart that's on page 10 of the guide. And that flow chart has 10 key questions that you go through to help define those roles and responsibilities. I should point out at this stage that it's really um, to help give an indication of roles and responsibilities. And every particular site will have its own particular subtleties and details. And expert assistance, particularly expert legal assistance, is often um, needed on a site-by-site -site basis to absolutely define what those roles and responsibilities are. But we've tried to give you a general overview um, of the process and help um, at the, that initial stage of understanding whether you're responsible for doing something with a particular site or not. Now, I've simplified the flowchart that's on page 10 of the guide um, to these slides, and essentially, depending on what site you're at, there are three possible routes to follow. Um, I won't go through each of these questions, I, ju I just simply do, don't have time, but in essence, the, f the route map asks is the site a permitted landfill? If it is, then it's likely that the landfill operator has certain duties and responsibilities that it needs to execute in accordance with its landfill permit, its environmental permit. Additionally, the landfill regulator will have roles and responsibilities here as well to ensure that those conditions are being met. If it's not a permitted landfill site, then the site may be determined as contaminated land. By that, I mean um, formal determination under Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act, if you're in England, Scotland and Wales, or Part 3 of the, um, I think it's Waste and Contaminated Land Order, if it's in Northern Ireland. So through the guide, you'll see Part 2A, Part 3 mentioned. Many of you will be familiar with that, but some won't. And that really is this um, determination of whether or not it's contaminated land. If it is contaminated land, we have a particular route to follow, which I'll explain in a minute. If it's not contaminated land, we have a different route to follow. So assuming that it is contaminated land, the roles and responsibilities really are determined by whether or not the polluter or the landowner can be traced. And then, if the enforcing authority can prove that that polluter or that landowner um, has, through either actions or inactions, um, caused a pollutant linkage to occur. If so, then the polluter or the landowner becomes responsible and liable for, for the site. If that link cannot be proven, or if the polluter or landowner cannot be traced, then the enforcing authority essentially becomes liable for that particular site. If the site is not designated as contaminated land, then I think there's a really, really important question that needs to be raised at the start of this next process. And that is, does the release of material from the site actually present a risk? In many cases, if there is a risk, it will have probably been designated as contaminated land. But there can be other risks presented from other sites. For example, it may not necessarily be um, due to elevated concentrations of heavy metals. It may instead be due to the release of very fine sediments like ash which cause um, a turbidity in the water column or fine sediments that then gets moved on to areas such as shell fisheries. If we consider that there is still a risk from the site that needs to be managed, again, even though we're under an undetermined route, we may ask those same questions about whether or not a polluter or a landowner can be traced. And if so, and the links can be proven, then they are liable for the site. If not, then really it falls through the, um, the various um, legislative powers that exist to either the Coast Protection Authority or the Flood Risk Management Authority to take ownership of the problem. Although under this route, we should point out that the legislation that underpins these um, 
sectors gives only permissive powers for um, the um, design and, and, and operation of works to prevent erosion or encroachment by the sea. So hopefully that gives um, a good overview of the um, how to define the roles and responsibilities at a particular site. And with that in mind, um, we then move on to the main part of the guide, this core guidance framework. This has been staged into six separate steps. Firstly, advice on how to identify sites, then how to characterize them, how to assess the risks, how to appraise the options that are available for managing those risks, how to deliver sensible solutions, and then evaluate the performance of those solutions, which of course feeds back into ongoing and updated assessments of the residual risk. So this is an ongoing cyclical management process, really. Um, to an extent, we've already heard a little um, this, uh, this afternoon about how to identify sites that are at risk. Um, if there's an ongoing erosion or flooding problem, you'll probably know about the site already. You'll have a call from a member of the public or you'll have seen it on one of your routine inspections. But if um, you don't yet know about a site um, or whether a site is at risk, there are two pieces of information you need. You overlap these two and you can see whether your site um, needs to be considered further. Um, as Jim mentioned, many permitted sites and areas designated as contaminated land already are covered in existing databases, registers by the enforcing authorities and, and the waste regulators. But there are many, many more that are actually unknown. You, you won't know about them until you start to see erosion at those sites, revealing certain materials. And as Dan mentioned earlier, um, there are existing tools available as well for understanding the scale of risk from erosion. So this is a schematic representation of erosion lines on the coast. So in this site, this example, the site may be impacted in about 50 years' time. Or flood zone maps. They give you the likelihood of um, uh, inundation under particular return period sea flooding events. Once you've identified the site, the next step really is to characterize as much as you can about its history and physical setting. And this can be achieved through a desk study, um, particularly in a forens very, very forensic approach is particularly needed for understanding the history of the site. There may have been many, many changes in land ownership, and therefore often legal advice is, is needed. You need to plow back through the, the um, ex you know, changes in ownership status. Um, also, sites may have been filled in different, with different material in different epochs. Really need uh, you know, to, to get down to, into as much detail as, as possible at this stage. The setting can be characterized by existing data sets, existing maps, things like um, admiralty charts, ordnance survey maps. Um, we heard about some coastal monitoring programs earlier. They can provide useful data. A site visit is always useful at this stage. The guide flags up some of the typical health and safety issues you need to consider, of course, um, and also comments about the benefits of visiting a site on numerous occasions at different tidal states. Um, this can really help understand the principal mechanisms that are causing release material from the site. It may not be occurring on every tide. It may be just particular storm events or, or particular sea surge conditions. And during this initial phase, some initial sampling of the site may be useful as well to help with the characterization. Probably wouldn't actually um, remove the need for more detailed intrusive sampling at a later stage but at this stage it could be quite useful just to do some limited initial sampling as well. So having done your homework, if you like, with those um, desk studies to help and site visits to help characterize the site, the next step is to assess the risk the site presents. And the guide uses the classic source pathway receptor risk model. And those of you who work in contaminated land will be entirely familiar with this. And you'll use this... I'm sure, routinely on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but people who work more in the coastal management sector may not be so familiar with this type of, of response. The guide goes on to um, help classify the types of sources that may be present within a site. And this is one of the areas where it signposts to other existing guidance. Um, so, for example, um, 
existing guidance on how to undertake site investigations and sampling to help um, assess whether a supplied as, as contaminated land or not. We also flag up that there are several categories of specialist site that really do require um, particular specialist assistance. And there, that's any site that's got biological or radioactive hazards, asbestos, or unexploded ordnance. The pathways, um, the guide presents four different scenarios for re the release of material into the environment, and you've, you've seen some of these already. Um, this is an undefended coastline where erosion is causing the release of the material directly, um, as well as the variations you saw earlier. Um, of course, the waste may not be right at the coastal margin. It may be set some distance back from the edge. And in that case, it's more of a longer-term strategic management issue. Um, we've got defenses that can be overtopped if their design criteria are exceeded or can breach or be undermined and material can be released in that manner. In some parts of the country, there are also defenses which actually have waste as core material. Um, there are several harbour structures, for example, that are like this. Um, also, clay embankments in low-lying areas such as estuaries often have, have waste in their core. And due to ageing processes or storm damage, material can actually be released from the defence itself. And finally, the, the fourth scenario is where there is a longer-term aspiration to actually remove a defence. Um, if there is waste within the back inland, then that can become inundated and mobilised by the tidal waters once the defence is gone. And this may be buried, but there, may, there are also examples where there are waste slag heaps on sites that are scheduled for managed realignment as well. The receptors that can be impacted by the release of these materials through these mechanisms really uh, can be categorised as humans, public health and safety issues, the environment, and we tend to often think about the natural environment and, and the ecology, but um, this can also have adverse amenity and landscape issues, particularly if the site is within a heritage coastal area, for example. Um, some material types can also affect property, um, buildings, infrastructure, crops. For example, um, you know, it's not only solids we're dealing with, there are gases and potentially leachates in, in certain sites that can move and, and affect property on surrounding area, and controlled waters can be affected in terms of water quality. Now, having considered the sources, the pathways, and the receptors, we link those together within a risk assessment process. And I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm sure every organization represented here has its own in internal risk assessment procedures, and they're well established and they, I'm sure, all define risk as the product of the likelihood of its occurrence and the consequence of its, um, and the consequence of its occurrence. But important things that the guide brings out in the context of the sites we're looking at is that we must remember that there may actually be more than one linkage that needs to be considered. And the risk assessment needs to be very, very robust at this early stage. There's no point coming up with a solution, or little point anyway, coming up with a solution that solves one problem if there are still three other unsolved pollutant linkages that are causing adverse effects. We also signpost to existing guidelines that exist across other industries, which can be used to help define thresholds for impact. So, for example, in, in terms of water quality um, or in terms of ecotoxicology, there are existing got documents available that enable you to determine whether the risk from a release of a particular quantity and type of material would be a particular, um, have a particular effect. And I'm sure all of your organisations um, risk assessment models have some form of categorisation of, of the risk that's presented, ranging from very low through to very high. Um, sometimes organisations have red, red, amber, green, rag type reports, whatever procedure you've got, it's probably worth using your own in-house tools to, uh, to, to undertake these, these assessments and embed it within your wider business management activities. And of course, this categorization of the risk helps to prioritize the management actions that you then need to take. And one very, very important thing that runs throughout the guide 
is that all the responses need to be proportionate to the risks that are presented. And I'll come back to that point, I'm sure, later during the presentation. So in terms of the options um, that exist, the fourth step in the guide helps you identify and appraise those existing options, those available options. Again, I'm sure you are all very, very familiar with um, option appraisal processes. There are some in the flood and coastal erosion risk management sector, environment agency, for example, appraisal guidance. Um, the nuclear sector has best available techniques as its kind of model. And the principles of each are very, very similar. The nomenclature is slightly different, but the principles are, are pretty much the same. And it involves defining the problem or the issue, um, as the, the nuclear industry defines it. And the source pathway receptor model is very useful at this stage. Um, defining the aims and objectives. And of course, at some sites, there may be legal drivers that force you to do certain things, and they need to be considered too. Um, defining a long list of options, screening it down to a short list, subjecting that short list to technical, economic, social, and economic assessments, and then coming up with a preferred option. And as I say, that option should be proportionate to the risks that are presented. Some of the options that the guide presents um, are, are described here. As with every appraisal process, you really need to start with the do-nothing option. Um, that enables you to look at the consequences of the release of the material and gives you a case for justifying the do-something approaches. Um, it's important to recognize that an option of inspection and surveillance may be appropriate for some sites. Depends on the risk presented, but that may be an appropriate option. It doesn't have to be necessarily a structural intervention. But then the guide goes on to look at three further options. The first involves actually removing the source. And this can be done by actually physically removing the material, taking it off site. But it can also be done by treating the material on site through various biological or chemical treatments, or taking the material off site, treating it, and then bringing it back. Now, as a coastal engineer myself, I found the information in the guide about some of these on-site and off-site treatment methods actually very useful because it broadened my horizon about what the, the potential solutions could involve. The next option that the guide considers is somehow physically breaking the pathway between the source and receptor. Now, that can be done by monitoring and clearing up any material that's released from the site. In some cases, that is a, a response that's proportionate to the risk that's presented. But in many other cases, um, a, a sort of more robust solution, if you like, is, is often needed. And that involves creating a physical barrier, um, either some sort of cap-in or cover system, an internal cut-off wall, or some form of coastal defense at the, the seaward margin of the type that you see in the, the images here. And then we must also consider a final option of actually removing the receptor. This is um, by far the least effective way of dealing with the problem. And if your receptor is actually a controlled water body or the natural environment, you, you obviously can't do that. But if your receptor is human, then you can put up fencing or warning signs to try and prevent the um, material that is continuing to be released coming into contact with, with humans. The next step of the guide provides some advice on how you then go to design and deliver the preferred solutions. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're not here providing a seawall design manual. If seawall is the preferred option, then we point you in the direction of the um, other documents that exist and can be used for that purpose. But what we do point out in this chapter is some specific issues that are um, arising in, in working on these sites. Um, and one of the obvious ones is health and safety issues. You've got two quite hazardous operations. Firstly, you're working in the marine environment, which in itself is always relatively hazardous. And secondly, you're potentially working with hazardous materials on site. So some advice is, is provided on that. <coughs> 
Similarly, um, a bit of um, advice is provided on how you design and or signpost into how you design and assess um, the preferred solution. And in this um, area, we also make reference to the environmental permits and environmental assessments that need to be undertaken, such as environmental impact assessments. There's a little bit of, a, of commentary also on some procurement issues that you'll need to consider. Bear in mind that even if you've gone and done some detailed investigations at a particular site, there will be residual uncertainties and residual risks. So um, you need to consider how you reflect those remaining risks within any contract that you develop with a contractor to, to execute the works. And for all those reasons that I explained earlier, the nature of the materials, the nature of the environment you're working in, um, there's some advice provided on the types of construction supervision that is usually needed on these sorts of schemes. I, again, as a coastal engineer, I, I, I was familiar with you know, supervising marine works, but actually the, the testing, handling, and reuse and disposal of waste material was actually very useful guidance to me um, when, when I um, uh, incorporated that aspect into the guide. And the final step um, involves monitoring and evaluating the performance of the solution. We recommend the development of a monitoring plan at the outset of the, the project that is defined according to the aims and objectives that were set out right at the start. It should be slightly broadened as well so that any unintended or unavoidable effects are also captured by the monitoring. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, there may be residual risks and uncertainties and the monitoring plan should definitely capture those as well. The types of monitoring, sorry, they should all be the, the same level of heading there, um, but they, it could involve simply visually inspecting the site. It may involve actual surveying works or it may involve sampling. Could be limited sampling or extremely compre comprehensive sampling, depending on the nature of the, the residual risks that are present. But the really important thing is evaluating the data that you receive so that you can go back into this cyclic management process. So if you're evaluating the performance, you then go back in to reassess the risks and then consider whether your option is still as it should or whether you need to amend it somewhat. Um, and that if you do, then you, you deliver that amendment and then continue monitoring. So it's an ongoing process. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of the first part of the guide. And I'll um, break my presentation there. Um, but I just leave you with this final slide in case you didn't catch the website where you can get the guide from earlier. So thank you for now. Thank you.